Senator Bell. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask the LAO um, uh, and staff, um, when you look at this um, issue of the cost of health care, there's a lot of factors that affect the cost of health care. Um, and I think when you presented this information, uh, there's other variables that you left out that I think we need to explore as potential areas to look at um, and measure whether or not we're being successful in. Um, one of which is, um, I would say, we have to look at how we perform in terms of negotiation of our health care contracts with the health care providers, um, how we do on that compared to other organizations. That's very important. Um, what is our overhead compared to other organizations? We have to have metrics, performance metrics. I, I think that um, uh, what personnel practices lead to higher health care costs, and are they able to be discussed either through bargaining or through other means? Um, there's other um, elements, I think, where people get health care. Uh, is our health care plan complicated and therefore more expensive? Is, it way, is there a way we can simplify it, make it easier for the employee, simplify the health care plan in some way? A lot of health care plans are very complicated, um, take a lot of administrative uh, work on the part of the health plan and the employee and the personnel department. So I think those issues should be explored. Um, we need to look at all those areas um, uh, in, in um, discussing um, the cost and see what kind, kinds of things we could do to um, reduce cost uh, outside of reducing benefits. Benefits is, of course, an easy way to reduce cost, but if you're not performing well, if you have an inefficient organization, if you're overcomplicated, um, it's always easy to point the finger at the benefit issues, but uh, I think we have to look at it in a more comprehensive way. Um, uh, perhaps um, at some point we have the auditor look at this. Something to think about for this committee. I'm on that PERS committee. I think that, um, you know, I, I, before I want to push that button, I'd like to um, have some um, reporting on uh, how we can use some metrics, performance metrics, in terms of uh, performance. Um, you know, I think those kinds of things have to be done in preparation for, you know, the discussion at the bargaining. I agree with the transparency issue. I think that's good. Um, uh, I also think that um, some of the decisions made on health plans have external effects, like what's the impact on workers' compensation when you have a high deductible plan, that's an issue because workers' comp is expensive. So, so um, those, those kinds of issues should be looked at um, and um, we should have more information on this. Uh, you know, I, I want to get this into performance management. That's, what, that's the bottom line, what I'm saying here. We can't just kind of go along with the old ways of doing things. Uh, we really, you know, I think it's clear we need to uh, prepay, I think it's clear we need to do that. But we also need to performance management on this. We need to change uh, how we look at this in terms of our management of our system. So we need some metrics, some performance metrics on outcomes. And uh, I don't think we have that yet. I think we need to develop that. Okay. So I, that's, I that's think that's opinion. a very good point. I'd <clears throat> like to also associate myself with those. And my question is then, it's because I'm also concerned with the nexus between policy and budget. Mm -hmm. Is the administration planning to go to policy committees, health, PERS, um, with the details of this? So we, um, I mean, we're pursuing our, our proposal through the budget process uh, because of the budget implications. With the, the, it's, it's really the purview of the legislature. We'll defer to uh, the members if, if there's a hearing and, you, and we'll be there. Oh, it, yeah, it, it seems to me that there should be policy consideration here for this. Um, um, 
and then also the nexus with collective bargaining, mm -hmm. because it does seem that this is uh, setting a new benchmark for collective bargaining. It's essentially laying down uh, <clears throat> the terms of collective bargaining before they've been collectively bargained. Um, doesn't it seem like that to you? Well, no, because um, there's certain elements. There's certain elements that are because um, I think it's important to, to not conflate what sort of the statutory role is versus what, what is bargained and what is bargainable. Because there's the, what is in bargaining is really the menu that the legislature statutorily creates. And so there's some, the first trailer bill, that's why we sort of broke it into two trailer bills. The first trailer bill are issues that really are not, um, really are not in the scope of collective bargaining at all. They're reporting requirements for the legislature and the administration. They're, um, you know, the requirement for CalPERS to, to offer more, you know, different health care plans, um, elements like that. The second trailer bill is really dealing with the actual, the benefit and the subsidies the state provides. And it was, th those issues ultimately are, they're in statute now and they need to be in Wisconsin statute at some point. And, um, but we did, we did carve it out into a separate trailer bill as more of a, um, is, is more of a signal to the unions that this is what we're, we're talking about. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it as we're laying down the terms because it's, they're, they're proposals and concepts that we'll be talking about um, with our with our. Yeah, well, labor. if the table is set and you can discuss where the fork and knife are going, but you can't discuss if you want to set the table differently, <laughs> I, I, I can see that being a matter of concern. I have a couple of quick questions just about the high deductible plan. Mm -hmm. Um, is there anything to stop, say, a healthy young person who suddenly gets cancer from going back into a regular plan after having been on a high deductible plan for a while? Not during open enrollment, you're free to change. ACA doesn't limit any sort of pre-existing conditions. Um, there's a, the, the world is very different under ACA now than it was maybe a decade ago. Um, but yeah, d d the open enrollment period, which happens annually, you'd be able to switch plans. Yeah, I, I do think, by the way, that if this goes to policy committees, the whole impact of the ACA should be considered because I can see how that would change the playing field uh, in a very profound way. Um, does, this, does the administration's proposal work without the high deductible option? Well, it's important, you know, it's important that we, we approach this proposal as a comprehensive plan that we just don't want to pre-fund a system that's grown enormously expensive. And so the, one, of the, one of the core issues of why the costs keep going up is because the benefit plans that are offered at CalPERS are all very rich. It's platinum, 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 gold, gold. Um, we, have to, we have to break up that model a little bit. Um, CalPERS needs a little bit of a push to do that, um, which is why we're pursuing this through statute. Mm -hmm. Right, because I understand from some of the previous hearings that they have in the past declined from adopting uh, one of these high deductible plans. Sure. Yeah. They, um, you know, the board, which is which is independent, we, you know, the, we have appointees on the board. Um, we're reminded, I think, monthly that we don't have a majority of members on the board, um, and so there's other ven venues that we're pursuing to get some changes to their benefit offerings, but. Um, so. Okay, and then I, I would like just to walk through very briefly um, the impact on a hypothetical employee in a fairly low wage job, right? So when we say 50-50 employee employer sharing of normal costs mm -hmm. going forward, and if the normal cost of a pension is, I think you said, 19,000 or 16,000. Well, that's the that. Is if I can um, jump in, yeah. So that's the that's the what the the value of the benefit during the current year is. So the normal cost, which you sort of have to unwind it back to, if just the the seed money you have to put aside every year during that employee's working years, it's significantly less than that. It's it's roughly about three to four percent of of payroll per person. Okay. So if a person made thirty thousand dollars a year, it would be. So 30,000, 30, yep. you know, if it, you know. One, I'll jump in really fast. One thing is to note is that the proposal would allow for a percentage of pay or flat dollar contributions. So while normal cost equals about three to 4% of an employee's mm -hmm. pay, um, it could in fact be a flat dollar amount that's 
established at the bargaining table. Okay. Right. okay. Thank, thank you. And then the other is I am concerned about the um, increasing the period of fully vesting. Just, you know, there's so many people that get golden handcuffs, <laughs> too, and, and can't move on, or people who have to move on, and there they've been paying in for 10 years. What does happen to them? Mm -hmm. They can't cash out their contribution? Well, so, it's, 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 so short answer is yes, but it's a little bit more nuanced mm -hmm. because, so currently, the way that the, the trust fund is established over at CalPERS, um, that was set up about, let's say, a decade ago, it was a very new world that, that uh, of pre-funding retiree health care. There's several different options of how you can go through the IRS and get a qualified trust fund and establish it. So at the time it was set up as a trust fund uh, for the employer that you, with irrevocable contributions. So the employees that are contributing today from the state cannot refund their contributions. I, I wouldn't say that this is a hard and fast position that the administration has at all. That just happens to be the current arrangement over at CalPERS, and that arrangement could be, could be changed. There's other, there's other variations of trust funds that the IRS allows, including ones that allow for refunds. So I, I see that almost as, a, almost as a technical administrative issue that just needs to get worked out, okay. rather than a, a, a big policy, like a, a policy mm -hmm. dispute. And, and do we know that all of our platinum and gold plans will uh, intersect with the ACA in punitive ways for employees in the state? So it's it's a little bit difficult to predict, but we can make some we can make some reasonable assumptions based on premium growth of when. So the the Cadillac tax hits in 2018. We're probably going to bump up against it pretty pretty soon at that point or after it. Definitely by 2020, we're looking at most of our plans probably exceeding that excise tax. The dollar, it, the way the tax works, it's 40% of the cost above the threshold. So every dollar is 40 cents on the dollar. Uh, and so, and, and, the, and the, th the Cadillac tax threshold also grows with inflation, but medical, medical inflation generally exceeds regular inflation. So it, it'll easily be in the tens of millions of dollars very, very quickly. And this is why I noted that we're going to wind up talking about the Cadillac tax probably a lot more over the next few years as it becomes more clear how so it's going to So the way work. it works now, if a person vests between 10 and 20 years, uh, what do they get at 10 years or what do they get at 20 years that's more? Sure. So at 10 years, you get 50% of the state's subsidy. Okay. Um, so that... Oh, and then it goes up to 100 And it goes up to 100%. So, it, so the 100% subsidy would be the $19,000. Okay, I just wasn't sure about that. And then also on page 12, you talk about the minimum deductible would be $1,300 for an individual and $2,600 for a family. Um, and it says minimum. Right. Could so a plan go up to be more? It could. So it could be ten, twelve thousand dollars deductible. Well, no, because then there's then you get on under ACA you get uh, sort of a ceiling on your out of pocket max also. Um, but so in our plan though, uh, we stipulated in, in the in the most recent version of the trailer bill, this would be in the silver category, mm -hmm. and so that that puts some um, that puts some parameters around what sort of uh, what sort of deductible. Um, should be offered with a high deductible health care plan. So our direction to CalPERS is pretty broad. It's just, it's provide a high deductible health care plan in the silver in the silver range. Mm -hmm. We think the deductible would be probably in that range, probably probably at that minimum level of thirteen hundred dollars. Okay. I don't know if the LAO. I was just going to provide a little bit more clarification to that. Um, the administration is essentially proposing to um, have CalPERS adopt a high deductible health plan as defined by federal law. And so that's why uh, they have the $1,300 threshold. It's not, it's not something that the administration is, is developed. It's based on the federal law. OK, great. Thank you. And then just a final comment. But I can't help noticing <laughs> that if one of the issues is that younger, healthier employees will join the cheaper plan, which would save the state money in the short term, um, leading to increased cost in other plans. I, the whole concept, to me, of insurance has always been that the younger, healthier people are in there with the older, less healthy people, and that that equalizes things for everybody. So I'm, 
I think that uh, it would be important for the administration to explain how anybody benefits from this and then just in the way we look at insurance and what sure. it does. Sure, yeah, the, the concern is that, uh, the concern we've heard from folks that are opposed to, opposed to this is that it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt the risk pool in some way. But um, as I mentioned earlier, this, it's really a, a function of, as you noted, as you noted, insurance does distribute risk across all the different parties, um, and that's going to continue to happen. We we subsidize retirees in many different ways that we don't subsidize uh, active employees and younger younger healthier employees. They get a higher the higher subsidy. Their retirees are pooled into the active pool, which is known as an implicit subsidy. There's a technical te that's a technical term. So they get cheaper health care benefits because they don't have to buy insurance separately for people in an older pool. Um, their Medicare supplement plans that we provide are basically free, mm -hmm. um, and they get this Medicare Part B, uh, Part B subsidy. You know, there's there's sort of winners and losers when you when you distribute risk around, and um, retirees are really have really been the winners with the way our health care plans and our subsidies have been arranged. And we do think that there's an issue of fairness that it's young people don't only exist to subsidize older people, is that young people are being forced to buy health care insurance in the platinum level that they don't need and they don't want. And it is appropriate to, to inject a little bit more competition in there. We don't think everyone is going to join these plans. We, we would estimate you know, maybe 15, 20 percent after a few years might, might be part of a, um, of a, of a cheaper health care plan, because it's not going to be the right choice for everyone. We don't expect the majority of employees to even join that plan. But if we can disrupt the model a little bit, we can, we can get some, some serious long-term cost savings in the long run.